um, which, a show of hands, how many people are familiar with? Oh, I've got friends in the room, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, I wanted to start off by, by saying, well, first of all, what that means is our organization is um, very large, which we'll talk a little bit about um, later, but I have the privilege of connecting with people in the community, organizations, businesses, learning institutions, just to talk about the work that we do and ways in which people can get involved. Like, I love that. I, I'm kind of a big connector, if you will. So um, I am here this morning because I met your friend, Vern. <laughs> so chew now, because I'm going to ask you to say something, Vern. Finish, Vern, finish what you're chewing. But Vern and I, <laughs> Vern and I met at a diversity um, coalition event, the Diversity Festival. When was that, Vern? July, I think? Um, oh, no, that July. Was July. July. It was July. But what was really nice is part of my role with this organization is to be involved in, with groups like that, just to, again, I like to hear what's happening in the community. I like to tell people what we're doing in the community so that we can identify collaborations, but also sometimes we identify gaps, right? Like what's not being done that maybe we can work on together. So um, Vern and I were talking, and Vern was telling me a story about something he did for his job many years ago that he really enjoyed. Um, which was, Vern, you were driving a bus for... Oh, Daytop. Daytop. But t could you mind just real quickly recapping that story you said? You, I think, if I remember correctly, Vern, um, your program was helping folks, uh, young people in substance recovery. Yes. And your privilege, yes. you, as yes. you described it, which I really liked, was to take the young people on an excursion to reward their being able to um, do well with together. the program. Hold it together for one week in every class in school. Holding it together for one week in every class of school, and then Vern would take them on an excursion. But so about 50% of the population, or 30%. So 50% or 30% would go. And, and, we would, and we called it Surprise Friday or Fun Friday. Um, and we would go to uh, roller skating, ice skating, but then we went to a few, a few interesting places like uh, Manhattan and uh, St. Uh, Patrick's Cathedral and uh, Statue of Liberty and just, uh, just a lot of uh, interesting places that these kids may not have experienced or, or been a part of. So it was just a privilege for me to be with uh, better kids wow. rather than stay back. I love kids who are succeeding. And succeeding. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll stop you there, Mark, because I'll tell you what I heard. And by the way, I think part of the reason that I, I got the job I have is because I like to talk, you know, big mouth. <laughs> big but another skill I think I have is a, lis a listening. I'm a good listener, right? Mm -hmm. And what I heard, and what I hope you heard when Vern was talking, and what I hope you saw on his face if you were able to do so, was a little bit of joy, right? Mm -hmm. Vern, like, it was part of his job, but it was a privilege to be allowing these young people to um, experience success, right? And experience community and to see hope, right? So when I was talking to, to Vern, it reminded me of one of our programs that we run that needs help with drivers. Like we have a, we have a social adult day center, which I'll talk to you about, um, which is a place that's funded through the county. It is a lovely, upbeat, wonderful place where folks who just want a little social interaction during the day with peers, or maybe who need a little assistance, or maybe who don't mind somebody bringing them coffee and serving them lunch and organizing games and entertainment. Um, but I said to her, I said, you know, the way you're talking about driving those students reminds me of the kind of person that we're looking for at the center. So I've been hounding him with emails. And he was kind enough to connect me with Pastor Audrey and say, what can we do for this woman to get her off my back? But in all seriousness, um, when I spoke with Vern and when I've spoken with Pastor Audrey, it's kind of an interesting, I think it fits in hopefully with your conversations on Sunday morning, just about, um, you know, your faith journey, right? Where you, where you are, where you've been, and kind of where you hope to be. So, um, I think at this point, I would just like to, if I may, I'm going to test Audrey's technical skills. I wanted to share a video about my organization that I think you will find very interesting. recognize some places. <laughs> ah, I told them not to do an ad. I know. It's <laughs> a price we pay. Yeah. <laughs> 
social safety net. Not services was started by the female charitable society of the first Presbyterian church in Morristown. They were coming together to address social needs related to the War of 1812. They wanted to help the widows, they wanted to help the wives, they wanted to help the children, they wanted to help the family of the soldiers. Women provided the basic coal, wood, cooking, clothing, especially for children, food. And for this, they had a budget of $3 per month. Women had a vision and they had a game plan. They took a map of Morristown and divided it into districts. One of the early leaders of the organization was Louisa McCullough. She was a woman of means, and she was a woman of color. Lizzie McCullough's granddaughter mentioned in a letter that they met here last Thursday without benefit of either whist or raffling. So apparently they got a fair amount of work done that day. In 1913, an exciting new chapter began, thanks in large part to Cleo McCullough, who lived here. Shall we pauperize our poor, or shall we help them become independent and self-respecting? That was the question posed by the women who remade the organization in 1913. The new Central Bureau for Social Services had a broader reach and a progressive approach to social work. They sought to end wasteful duplication. How sane is it that one family should receive five Christmas dinners while other, perhaps in greater need, receive none. Professionals were hired. Time to see Mrs. Sherry Welcome. What line of work were you in? I was a salesman. You were a salesman? I was truly need help. Uh, we're out of money. Well, what we'll do for you, Mr. Smith, is I will send Miss Jones over to your home over later this week. but I hope you see why I wanted to share it with this community because this um, this church has been a big part of what is now called, well, I guess in 2013 we uh, renamed Cornerstone Family Programs and then, whoops, I'm, my friend at home. I'm going to start again so you can hear, sorry, but um, that is an older film, but I thought the history and the connection of this congregation with our organization was um, actually kind of cool to see. And a lot of the thrust of what we're trying to do is to help those in need with dignity, right? You know, we're not trying to make them feel bad. We're trying to provide things that they need. We're trying to also, um, you know, build a sense of community, um, of hope, um, and also just do the right thing. So um, the woman in the video, Patrice Picard, is still our CEO. Um, and... I think what's really interesting is about, I think it was a, shortly probably after this was made, we merged with, uh, it used to be Family Services of Morris County, which is a lot more like case management work, um, merged with the Neighborhood House, which has also been around for about 200 years, doing wonderful work for the community. Most of you know we have the affordable housing district um, right back behind um, down Flagler Street and in that area. Um, we kind of changed our 
course of programming to be more um, programs than case management. And I really respect, Patrice Picard has a great attitude. She's like, let's do what we do well. There are a lot of people out there who are doing case management, who are doing um, the human services, um, providing part of that. So we kind of see ourselves as we connect them to that. We provide certain services and we connect them. Um, any comments on the video? Did you recognize anybody? Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Yeah. Where, tell us where we can find it. Let's see it again. It's on YouTube. And I will, I'll share the, well, actually, you have a link. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the links with everyone. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I really had to dig for it, too, because, again, it's so interesting when organizations change. So now, you know, we have a really long name, Cornerstone Family Programs, Morristown Neighborhood House, but because no one wanted to lose the identity of the neighborhood house. That's been around for a long time, and just by the way, if you want to be cool, it's called the Nabe. That's what the kids call it. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's the history and the depth of our experience allows us to do things, I think, um, that we would not ordinarily be able to do. We are a nonprofit. We have a diverse um, uh, ways of getting funding through some county, some state grants. We do private foundation grants. We do individual donations. Um, we uh, do fundraising. So uh, we're able to do everything we can do because of that funding, but more really because of the relationships we have with the community because people know us and people also know that what we're doing is quality work. Unfortunately, in this day and age, right, you have to be very careful about where you put your, um, your funds. So. I wanted to, to share that you know I've lived in and worshipped, I'm a member of the Morristown United Methodist Church, your friends across the street, I've worked for over 30 years in this area and did not know about the neighborhood house, which I was an active volunteer. Like our, I have chaired our women's group, I have done our angel tree for many years, I was on the director of the um, uh, uh, community organization, the, and I'm just blanking on the name, which I love it, but the, the group in the church that keeps communications open about what's going on. I have been an active, active member and had no idea they were there. And I think when Audrey and I were talking, it's like my, what I like to do personally is connect people to either their inner strength, their faith, right, resources. Um, that's a big passion of mine. So when I, um, I'll back up, uh, back up a second and tell you my story. So let's see. First of all, I grew up in the Methodist Church in um, Virginia, then in Delaware, and I was blessed enough to have parents who were very active in the church, not only active in the church volunteering, but that's where their um, social connections were. Do you know what I mean? They, they were out Saturday night at dinner with the same people that they sat with Sunday morning in Sunday school. So I feel very blessed, honestly, that I grew up um, in that environment, our church was the place to be. We had youth programs and drama programs, and it didn't matter what your faith was. Everybody wanted to come and be with us, so it was a really positive experience. I did ASP, <coughs> the Appalachian Service Project, when I was young, when I was back there, so very strong in my faith group. <coughs> Came to, married a Catholic guy who got married in Methodist Church, so I'm very lucky. He's the youngest of 10, Irish Catholic, um, but faith was really important to him, family was really important to him, service was really important to him, so um, I was very blessed that way. We've both been active. I think he's been on our um, Appalachian Service Project for our church for 11 years running. Um, so we have three children. My oldest is 27. My youngest is 21. And um, when I had first had my, my daughter, my oldest, uh, we had some tragedy in the family and that my, we lost a nephew to suicide on um, New Year's Eve. And on the way down to the funeral, my husband's mother, um, my nephew's grandmother, was killed in a car accident. Oh. So it was a gut punch. I didn't know what I was going to do about work. I, I left out before I had children. I had a career. I was starting. I was somebody. You know, I was. I ran. I worked for a couple PR firms. I was executive director of the Hackettstown Area Chamber of Commerce for a few years, and then I was with the Morris County Chamber. I was vice president and general manager and I ran their Leadership Morris program. So I was going places and doing things, and then these little babies come along. I don't know if you know, they change your, your wife a little bit. <laughs> um, and then also with this, in all seriousness, tragedy with my, within our family, you know, it changed, changed my perspective a little bit. We were blessed, my husband had a really great job um, as a consultant for JP, for JP Morgan, <clears throat> and it was like we made a decision that I was gonna focus more on raising our children and also helping his father. So fast forward, but what I did was I got really involved in my church. Like, you know, I kind of, I thought I'd keep my skills sharp. You know, I'd promote some events, I'd you know, run some budgets, I would do some things, um, which I really, really enjoyed. 
Um, but personal share, um, our oldest identifies as non-binary, um, has had a lot of mental health problems, has um, been hospitalized for suicide uh, ideation a few times. Um, we've had strained relations over the years, despite my best attempts to be, I'm a very open and accepting person, but you know, things happen how they happen. Um, but what was interesting was over the course of these things happening, I also, um, my brother and wife were attending the Methodist church that I grew up in in Delaware, and they had this couples connection program. And by the way, somebody help me watch the time, because I'll talk to you all day if I, <laughs> let me like, let me like wrap up. But it was interesting because the couples connection program would have a topic for the couples to, you know, to work on, but then they were required to take a date afterwards. And the program provided childcare. I'm like, that is a brilliant idea. So I said to my sister-in-law, what would you change about it? She's like, well, they, they were doing it the timing she didn't really like. She's like, I would do it in time that you can feed the kids dinner while the parents are connecting, and then put their jammies on them, and when the parents come pick them up, they're putting them in bed. So I love the idea, but I don't know if you've ever, especially in a church situation, not wanted to make a suggestion, because you know, some pastor is going to say, Fern, great idea. How about you run that? Yeah. So I was, you know, I was really like, I thought it was a great idea, and I wanted it, and I needed it. But at the same time, I'm like, I just, I was, at that time, I think I had three. And I'm like, oh, I do not have time to be. And I was doing things for the women's group and all these other things. So, um, but a friend of mine at our church, who was a family therapist who was divorced, said to me, if there's anything in you that you think you can do it, do it because you, there's nothing out there to support happily married couples and it is not easy and I, I might be telling you something you don't know but you know to be in a relationship where you're happy it's not it's work there's work involved so um i bit the bullet 15 years later um i was running that program for our church which was just a wonderful community right it, it was a community it was peer support to be honest um of course can you imagine how well situated it is here in town right because we would uh, feed the children, they play, we have a gym upstairs, and then the parents could walk to dinner and be back. So it was a wonderful experience for me, but it also opened my eyes to my passion for peer support, you know, which is, um, you have to be skilled at having people share, but not sharing anything they don't want to share too much of, right? But it helps us all to know that we're not alone, because my passion, like my thing, my jam, if I had a cape and a superpower, it would be connection, right? Because the worst thing ever is to feel isolated. Right? When you feel isolated and alone, it's paralyzing. And I know we've all, at one time or another, felt that way. And just to hear somebody else say, I get it. Like, you know, my situation isn't exactly yours, but I get it and I understand, I think is the first step towards being able to tackle whatever it is you're tackling. So uh, 15 years of doing that, and then um, came time to, when well, my youngest was probably a sophomore in high school, and my husband was doing a little job changing around at that time. I decided to go to work outside of the house and started, it was really interesting, there was a peer, um, there was a program that they were looking for, a facilitator for parent support group. I'm like, this is me, right? I've done this for 15 years, this, I should do it. But what I didn't realize, it was a family support organization. Do you know what that is? Family support organizations are state funded and run for, um, every county has is representation of one, the one that I worked for was Morris and Sussex County together, but it's when there's a child who has a challenge from anything, like, I mean, it can be um, mental health to um, school avoidance to learning disabilities to, um, they do d uh, developmental disabilities, but it's not focused on that. But the whole point was this organization, a family support organization, provides support to the parent while the state program provides support to the child, right? Like they'll bring in a therapist, they'll bring in a tutor, they'll, you know, set certain programs up for them. But we all know when it's happening to the child, it's happening to the parent. And guess what? The parent also has stuff going on. You know, we had, I can remember one situation, we had a child who was struggling in school, and when the family support partner went to visit the home, mom is a hoarder. And here you have this poor boy who can't find a, a space to work and do his homework. So you can do all you want with the child in school, but if you don't know what's going on at home, you know, that's so, I really, um, long story longer, I ended up not facilitating their parent support group. When I went there, they offered me a, another job that was outreach, shock, blah, you know, me running my mouth telling people about what we do. Um, and it was interesting because um, then the pandemic hit. And part of my responsibilities there before the pandemic was they had a, a monthly education program that mostly the um, community partners and um, service organizations would attend. 
But when the pandemic hit, I changed that to weekly programs that we did on Zoom. And then we went from having two support groups a week to having seven, just to, first of all, legitimize why we were even like, what, what it was we could do to serve. But I don't have to tell you, the needs went through the roof as far as people needing connection and what have you. And it was a tremendous learning experience for me because what I, my weekly um, educational program allowed me to meet people who were doing good work to tell everybody else out there who's doing the good work. You know, I, good, I interviewed Good Grief. I interviewed this thing called Cornerstone Family Programs that I didn't know anything about. And I remember um, I knew the gal who I actually now report to. And when I asked her to be on this program, which was an hour long, um, I said, do you have enough to talk about? And like, 45 minutes is a long time. And she was like, oh. I'm fine, and let me tell you something. Now, now I'll tell you. This is not to talk about for three days, you know, all these things. But um, at any rate, uh, I, I transitioned from that program, obviously, to Cornerstone Family Programs in my role, which um, I think spiritually, it's interesting how gratifying it is to me. Like I said, to connect even with the couples program. A lot of times you're connecting them to faith, right? Because they were always faith, faith-based programs, mostly. Um, or you're connecting them to their spouse or their partner, or you're connecting them to other people in the church or to resources, right? Sometimes people don't know. There's so many, I always feel like there's no shortage of people who want to help, and there's no shortage of people who need the help that's bringing them together, right? So um, I'm very gratified by my role at Cornerstone because we do, I have some, I have some statistics for you here. Let's see, or some numbers that you'll appreciate. Um, we have, I don't know if you know, but in the neighborhood house, if you ever drive by, it looks kind of small from the front. Like, oh, little brick, so cute, little brick building. Well, in that little brick building, we have nine preschool classrooms. Just, nice. came, just came, changed to nine. We had eight before this uh, fall. So that's 127 preschoolers wow. every day. Wow. Hold on to your hats. Wow. We do a before and after school program for the five elementary schools in the district, bringing in another 131 students. Those I don't students, know. I'll have oh. to see who the moderator is. Hi, Nikki. <laughs> That's Nikki. Do you want to? Uh, can you hear me? Ask, ask him to mute. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear? Can you hear Nikki? Yes. Okay. If you could just mute uh, for now, that would. Oh, actually, I can. You can mute. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, oh, I need you. Okay. First of all, I think it's pretty cool that we can do this, right? Pre-COVID, we couldn't do this. Like, I think that's really awesome. Um, so, 131 after school students. Yeah. It's on you. It's on you. Kids. Now those children are dropped to us, many of them at 7 a.m., and we are the official bus stop for their respective schools to pick them up. So they come to us at 7. Um, they come back to us at 3.30, so if we do tours, which if you've not taken a tour, I would love to show you around, but those kids come running off that bus, just like... You need to tell them they need you mm -hmm. much. You have to reach us at the time to reach you. Can you go to turn down the volume? Um... So those children, our priority is the after-school kids. Well, we see, in our preschool programs, we see. <coughs> not every preschool uh, program does. I have been on both sides of this, by the way, haven't you? Like when you don't realize you're talking and everybody can hear what you're saying? Thank you. Um, so our, we feed them, in our preschool uh, program, we feed them. And in our before and after school program, we feed them what we say an after school snack, but it's really hearty. It's like beans, rice, fruit, veggie. Because we're not sure what they're getting when they're not with so us. And I'll back up a second and tell you that years ago when the neighborhood house started, we were serving primarily Italian immigrants. Then over time, it turned into primarily African Americans. And now we were at about 96% Latino. So the children that we serve, most of them live right in that area, which I love, the whole neighborhood house is the neighborhood house, right? Those children come right to us. Um, most of their uh, parents do not speak English, and some do not read or write in their native language. So our priority 
is giving these children the best education that we can, feeding their bellies, and making them feel seen, valued, and heard. Right? Our preschool, our preschoolers get excellent remarks from the school systems when they go. When it's time for them to go to kindergarten, they're ready. Sometimes they're ready more than other children from other programs. So we are very, very proud. We just got our four-star rating um, in the uh, oh, Grow New Jersey Kids, I think, is the system that evaluates preschool programs. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, and then what we also do for these after-school kids is we try to give them enrichment opportunities that they may not otherwise have. We have scouts, we have STEM programs, Mayo Performing Arts Center comes in and does art programs, we have um, recreation, we have um, uh, Mending Arts is a program that um, there's a grant for that helps kids who might have a uh, little experience uh, with trauma. So Mending Arts is a program that helps them sort of work through some of that. So it's an incredibly uplifting program uh, we have success stories that I could go tell you about children who won, um, as a young man who's working for us now, who lost his mother, immigrant family, um, financial challenges, and he was really struggling. And he came to us as a student. He's come back to us as an employee, which when we have our counselors in training, we train them. And we're looking for the kid to, to tell them how to look somebody in the eye and do a firm handshake. How do you dress for work? How do you speak at work? You know, accountability. You need to be on time. You need to dress appropriately. All those good things. But this uh, young man, we had the teachers call us and say, what are you doing? Because he is night and day. Like, he is really coming into himself. And we have countless stories like that. Everything that we do is about creating a community. We have a um, drill step team, which I don't know if, if, might be a little out of your experience, but it's the dancing that's like kind of militaristic. They can do a lot of, well, you saw them perform, I think, right, at the, at the festival. They do a lot of the stamping and clapping, and you know, it's very, Stiff, but it's wonderful, but it's a drill team that I think it's uh, ages 11 to 18. And it's a, it's a team, it's a, it's a sport, it's an activity, but it's also a community. Because those kids, if the grades start to slip, we know, we ask, what's going on? What's happening at home? What's going on? We had even one of our um, staff members, <coughs> her mother, who was not in great health, who was on dialysis and really struggling with a lot of different things, said, you know something, I'd really like to make dinner for the, that group. Can we start that once a week? So last semester, once a week, those kids went home with tins of pasta. You would have thought we gave them a pot of gold. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they were just, it made them feel special, seen, heard, and valued. So um, that's what we do at the neighborhood house. Yes, please. Do you involve the high school kids somehow as, as uh, service projects? The them? question is, do we involve the high school kids? And the answer is, we involve anybody who we can get our hands on because we have um, a lot of, uh, part of my responsibilities also is um, volunteer management. We have a volunteer coordinator. We have uh, classrooms come in from different schools. We have high school students come in. We have a wonderful relationship, Drew University. Um, during the pandemic, by the way, we were only closed for a year because our parents didn't have the luxury of working from home, working remote. Our children needed a safe place to be and they needed to be fed. So we had um, support from Drew University for tutoring online to help our kids get through the pandemic and that kind of thing. St. Elizabeth's, we have all sorts of, um, again, this is part of my function too, it's just to make people aware of what we do and opportunities to plug in. Um, I wasn't strong arming Burn to drive for us, though I'd love for him to. But, <laughs> but no, the whole thing is, is we try to, and if we listen and see what somebody may be moved to do. And sometimes it's writing a check, honestly, great. Sometimes it's showing up to read to our children. Sometimes it's showing up to help in the Adult Day Center. Um, sometimes it's just hosting. We have these events that are really wonderful called a friend raiser, which I love because it really is a legitimate, not, we're not looking for a check to be written, but a friend raiser helps us tell people what we do, because chances are people have things they can contribute, right? You know what I mean? Like, a, I'm not just talking money, I'm talking services, I'm talking, um, we're having a boo bash for the community in the community center, um, I think it's on the 27th of this month, and they were looking for somebody to donate pizzas. Like, there's just, there's so many different ways to get involved, or somebody to help judge the costume contest. Like, there's always opportunities. So, great question, Burr, but yes, we do. We try to involve, um, that's why I am involved in something like the Diversity Coalition, um, in particular for the Adult Day Center because that's a program that most people don't realize exists. And I think of um, religious organizations in particular as being so aware of the needs in our community, right? Who recently lost a spouse? Who is in failing health and could just use a little stimulation? You know, we've got loneliness, back to my thing about isolation, right? Isolation's terrible. Nobody should ever 
suffer because if you, or if you're caring for someone who's failing, right, that caregiver can feel really isolated. So it's, it's, it's all kind of related. Um, so we do all those good things in Morristown, but we also do three after school programs in Dover. And guess what? Dover has a very similar demographic to the children that we're serving here. Um, we've done the after school program there for nine-ish years, more years. It's been there, it's been established for a while, but just this week we opened four preschool classrooms in the St. Mary's Church on Main Street in Wharton, but it's, it's a collaboration with uh, the Dover School District. So there we'll be able to service 60 more children. It's a beautiful facility. I toured it for the first time this week. I mean, it's really um, top notch. So all said and done then, we have 258 kiddos in Morristown. We have the potential to serve 160 in Dover. Our preschool program is not yet full, but I know it will be soon. And we also pro uh, provide 551 meals a day between the two or the two towns, and then we also have our social adult day program, which does provide lunch as part of the program. Um, so I think if it's okay, can, can I test you for another video? I'll see if we can do it. I wanted to <laughs> add it out. Um, while she's while she's in, I'm telling you, you're earning your keep this morning. I hope somebody's giving you some good coffee. Um, one of the so that the other programs we run, the social adult day center, I supervise, I oversee that. We have a staff three full time and we have about uh, 15 part-time folks there, and then we do take volunteers who wanna come in and just help. We have about a one to four ratio of team members to clients that come in. We have people who drive themselves there. We have people who, we provide transportation. Hello, hello, all in Morris County provide transportation. Um, we have people who live on their own. We have people who live with a child. We have people who um, live, we have three clients, I believe, from the convalescent center that just like to just come for a day just because it you know, shakes up their routine and what have you. But the center is, which is why I want to show you the video, it is not that one. This one? This one, yes. Well, I'll show you. Audrey, I think I owe you a coffee. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> My name is Pat Kramer, and I'm the director of the Cornerstone Family Program Adult Day Center, located in Morris Plains, New Jersey. Today, I'm happy to give you a peek into our center that our... Okay, hello, this is my That offers a bright, safe, friendly destination for aging adults who are seeking companionship, a hot meal, and a great way to spend weekdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Caregivers love us too. They appreciate the respite, resources, and supports we provide. When a loved one is with us for the day, they can go to work, run errands, or simply rest worry-free. Transportation can be available to and from our spacious, bright facility, which features lots of windows, upbeat seasonal decorations, and a lovely outdoor patio. Every day is carefully planned with a variety of activities designed to engage our clients and keep them moving. On a typical day, we start with a light breakfast together in our dining area, followed by mind-sharpening activities like playing cards, solving word scrambles, or reading the news. We then enjoy a group discussion surrounding daily chronicles, word games, and trivia. Next, we participate in a physical activity like chair exercises or a game requiring some movement. At noon, we enjoy a delicious lunch together. And in the afternoon, we have our day's main activity, which ranges from doing a craft-like painting, playing a game as a group, or enjoying a visiting entertainer. In between activities, we often travel from one end of the center to another, as the change of scenery keeps us all alert, engaged, and happy. If you'd like to know more about our adult day center, give us a call, schedule a tour, or enroll your loved one in a free trial day. My team and I are here for you.
center in a separate building? Or is no, it you, you, can, you can say hi. Uh, the Morrisview Healthcare Facility. Oh. Run. It's, in, it's part of that building, but we are not a part of Morrisview, okay. but it's in the same building. And that building was back, built. It was actually designated that room to be okay. an adult day center. That's confusing. That's a good question. Last one, Audrey. She's off today. 
I don't know what it is, she couldn't be pleased, but <coughs> we hear that and we treat it just like you would the child, do you know what I mean, as far as understanding and keeping an eye out. Like we've had, there's one gentleman who works with us, Charles, who I just adore, he's also a former police officer, there's a theme there, um, but he has said many things to me over um, the course of my working with him for two years, and one of them was, he said, you know, any one of these people could be my mom, you know, or my dad, because I, that's, that's what keeps me coming every day. And he said one time someone came to him and said, Dad has had a really rough morning. Can you sit with him today? And Charles goes, I feel badly because I can't, I, you know, the ratio doesn't allow me to do that. But he goes, I got it. Uh, we're on it. We're watching it. And I think that is really that peace of mind and that level of care is just so meaningful. And, you know, I'll, I'll slide back to our preschool program and say the same thing. If you knew how well our team members know our students, do you know what I mean? Like I was one uh, young... One young one who was really having a tough time, and um, the vice president oversees all of our programming. I heard her talking with this little one, and I, next thing I know, I walk by her office, and there's a cot in her office, and she's sleeping. And I said, I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, she was being very difficult in class, but here's the deal. Mom and dad aren't together. Dad's new girlfriend just had a new baby, and she spent the weekend with them. The new girlfriend doesn't really like former daughter. She's had a rough time. She needs to sleep. And I thought to myself, I'm like, that, that is how I would hope somebody would treat my child, my parent, my sister. You know, like, so it's, it's that level of care of, of getting to know who we're serving and trying to meet what their needs are, not what we think they need. That's the other thing I'll tell you about Cornerstone is we don't, Patrice Picard has been with us for a long time. She has, was served on our board of directors before becoming our CEO. And she doesn't sit in an ivory tower and come up with ideas and programs. You know, it's more, um, it comes up from what we're seeing and what we're, what we're hearing and what we're um, feeling is needed. For instance, we have a, a newish new -ish program called Boys to Men. We have this fabulous gym, part of our facility, and we open it to the community, which that they missed that over um, COVID. But we have uh, basketball nights and soccer nights and what have you. And, one of our staff members that was working with uh, some young boys realized that some of the middle schoolers were a little rough around the edges and weren't really being kind of kind to one another and didn't know what sportsmanship was like and didn't know how to articulate when they were frustrated. So he came to our vice president, Jackie, same person who did the nap, and said, you know, I really think I need to have a conversation with these young men about what's okay and what's not. So he bought him a pizza, which he said he had to keep his hands away from the box because they devoured it. But out of that came a newer program called Boys to Men, that meets once a week. They take them, we have a small kitchenette area um, in our facility, and he teaches them to make something basic. He said, every young man should know how to feed themselves, whether it's macaroni and cheese, whether it's a grilled cheese sandwich, you know, whatever it is. And then they talk about things like character, healthy relationships, boundaries, that kind of thing. But I mean, again, that came up, right? Not from someone, you know, trying to orchestrate what how things should be done. So I have a great sense of pride on that. And same thing, um, the Social Adult Day Center, we provide, yes, a happy, great place for people to be during the day, but it's also helpful to those who love them or care about them, right? And, and with the drivers, they can communicate between who they pick up and us and vice versa. Mom had a great day today or woo. <laughs> so you might you know, be careful, she's been touchy today or whatever it might be. Um, trying to think, oh, do you have any questions? I'm throwing a lot of information at you. The, the drivers, do they stay at the daycare during the day yeah. or do they just pick up, drop off, and then? With the drivers, and I'll, and I'll tell you this, in all seriousness, we are, you asked me about volunteers and stuff, we are happy to have volunteers also, and we are, I think what we can claim is we are a nonprofit. We cannot boast that you're gonna be getting rich by any help that you give to us. We <coughs> offer volunteer opportunities, we do um, paid staffing volunteers, but what we preach is our flexibility because you can come in one afternoon a month if you want. You can come in um, for volunteering or even staffing. And we have folks who work every day, we have folks who work every Tuesday, we have folks who work full day, half day, what have you. And the drivers have morning routes and they have afternoon routes. So it's very, uh, during, and it works for some people who just kind of want something to do with them. You don't have, your whole day is not tied up. I mean, obviously, it's interesting, I think this is a highlight of our program and it also is a challenging management-wise, is that we are as flexible as our clients. So nobody signs up ahead of time for you know, every day of the month and is charged. It's more like you say, obviously we need to know when they would like
like to come, but if you wake up that morning and mom is not feeling well, you call and say, I'm sorry, she's not coming in today, and that's an okay thing and you're not charged. Like that to me is huge because those things happen, right? So that at the end of the month, it's tabulated, you know, how many whole days were you with us or half days, and that's how it, it figures out. So that flexibility is wonderful, but can you imagine how difficult that is for our, I'm not gonna say difficult, it's a challenge for our drivers, but they work with it. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, it burned today. I'm not cool. I don't have to go to um, Long Valley today. So I'll help you with these three routes. You know, we have certain vehicles that do better with, um, you know, some clients, sometimes it's hard getting into a van, right? Sometimes it's easier to get into a sedan. So it is very dynamic every day. They have on and say, what's the best way to get who we need to get? Um, and you have the facilities, you have the vehicles. We have the vehicles there, yep. Yeah. So we, we have don't vehicles. Use our own. You don't use your own vehicles. You drive to us. You pick up the car. Um, I just think it's a really, you know, again, it's a, it's an operation that is teamwork, 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 right? Everybody's kind of tag teaming on. Sometimes, yeah, so a car needs to be taken into the shop. Who can take it? Who can do? You know, we, it's it's very dynamic, but I think it works. You know, and I think people appreciate that flexibility um, because you don't always know. And I think there's there's not having that. Some people, and I will say too, we do a, a free trial day for clients, which is really nice, and we know pretty much right away whether it's a, a hit or a miss. And most times it's a hit, but sometimes people just might walk in and be like, I don't like this, I don't want this, for whatever reason. But more resistance comes from the loved one, right, Who's, who might feel guilty. But I'm telling you, it's so wonderful. I mean, I felt really great walking into this room this morning, right, and seeing people who I knew were here to be with me. To be with each other and i think that's what they feel like going into you walk into the place there's an aroma of coffee and like i said little seasonal decorations and the, i cannot say enough about the, the team members because by the way not everybody can work there drive there volunteer there be floor staff there because you got to be patient you know you might hear the same question 10 times you know <laughs> you've got to have a sense of humor right you've got to have some dignity and i i just i thought when i had spoken to don um before we did the video he had told me that he was on vacation, but he goes, you know, he goes, when I come back, he goes, people are so, where have you been? He said, the ones who are able, because not everybody's able, we do have some early onset dementia um, folks that are with us, but it's such a sense of community, you know what I mean? And I think um, the communication that's constant about what one person might notice that the next doesn't, just as far as how somebody's doing, how they're improving, how they might be struggling. And there's a lot of conversation that goes back and forth between our, um, team members and families, right? I mean, that's, you know, the hardest day for us is when we have to say that mom's just too much of a fall risk or mom's um, not able to participate. Folks who come to us, by the way, for the most part, um, can feed themselves and take care of bathroom uh, duties, but we do have a certified nursing assistant who's with us every day who can help. I mean, there's times when you need a little assistance. Um, and it's interesting that even if someone's not overly um, uh, participatory like in the events that we're doing they don't they choose where they sit they choose what they do when we do a game it's in a big circle so everybody even if you're not playing you're watching and if you're I, we've had people say oh, I can't get mom to paint at home I can't get her to do I can't get her to do anything well guess what if mom's sitting at a table and everybody else is doing something mom is probably gonna do it and enjoy it because it's a totally different situation and there are studies that say that even when people are sitting side by side, even if they're not directly communicating, mm -hmm. the sitting side by side is good for you. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, oh, isn't that nice? It's good for your heart, it's good for your mind. It is such a benefit. So I just think, um, you know, statistics are all over the place. They eat better, they sleep better. That's, um, we have some uh, testimonials which are really sweet and one of them was like, my, well, I, I, I'm gonna stop there. Was that I was there one day with this uh, woman who was bringing her sister, I think it was like 14 siblings, and this woman was bringing her sister. And she said to the director, and I just happened to be there, and she goes, what are you doing to her during the day? And of course the director was a little bit like, oh, please say more, what's going on? And she said, she's sleeping like a baby. But it's the stimulation, right? I mean, it's, and it's also sometimes, you know, the folks will say, well, it's a purpose. You know, it's Tuesday, I come, and I sit down, and Pat brings me a cup of tea, and we, the room is really long. Um, it's probably longer than this section here, but we, we start here, and then we all get up, and we walk to the other end of the room, a little movement, a little change of scenery, and then when they're down there doing um, this day in history or some kind of word scramble, they're changing the table set up, just as you were saying, Vern, you can do here. And then they might have some kind of physical activity. Um, Vern was asking about bringing um, students, and we have um, 
Right now, St. Elizabeth's has um, occupational therapist students who are working with us who come in to get experience with the population. We've had um, interns from Morris County Votech. Um, we have, oh, this is like my, I can't believe I'm just now, I'll be quick, this is my last thing. We had a, um, <clears throat> this beautiful piece of artwork, this bag, which is a gift, by the way, from my technical assistant this morning. Um, we had this mural placed on our seniors helped create it. We had uh, more Performing Arts Center had gotten a grant for Aging Gracefully, and we had a, a teaching artist come in and work for 18 sessions with our clients to create this beautiful piece of artwork that's now mounted on our wall. But it was really cool because he said, what colors do you want to see? What images do you want to see? And then he uh, very cleverly tested the abilities of folks to see how they could contribute. So everyone participated, but if your ability was just that you could drag the, the paintbrush across the paper, so be it. You did that and then he cut it into a shape that was um, put into the artwork. Um, I will send you some other links that if you want to, if you have an email, if you just want to share, but it's really a fascinating um, activity. But again, it's an example of the things that because we're so, we have pet therapy come in, we have musicians come in, we have a huge holiday celebration every year where we have companies that provide gifts for all of our clients and gift cards and uh, as you saw Santa comes in and it's just it is just a very um, we make great effort to make it joyful you know right we all have today we don't know you know what tomorrow is going to bring but it's really a pleasure to work with that program and I am going to stop talking because I could talk on and on <laughs> and Bert, thank you and Audrey thank you for this opportunity just to share you know it's nice when your personal mission, right? Like like I said, connection's my secret sauce. I'm blessed to be working for an organization that what we're trying to do is help good people who want to help connect to people who need the help. And that is in so many different ways, right? That can be, like I said, if you're writing a check, if you're volunteering, if you're a donation of goods, um, but also just by spreading the word that we're here and that we're doing good work. And we do collaborate a lot. I was saying to Audrey, like for instance, when somebody's like, my, even at my own church, by the way, like we should start it. You know, English is a second language. That's what this community needs. Well, in my opinion, there are other people doing that. How about you see what they need help with? You know, we, we talk to the Salvation Army, right? We're not, it's not competition like in the day of business where I'm selling widgets and you're selling widgets and we don't want to talk. It's, it's collaboration, right? Because together we can do great things. So that'll be my ending note. Together we can do great things. Here's my <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Well, I will be sending all the links to everyone, so you will get the links this week um, if you're on our um, newsletter, so you'll be getting those. But thank you so much. This is wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And next week, we'll be having someone from Princeton, so a little bit different context for our um, community of faith voices, so someone from the seminary to talk about that context as well. Yeah. And I'll send that uh, to you digitally, too. Okay, good. If you know people who